Welcome to the Good Growth Podcast, brought to you by BGF, the most active equity investor in the UK and Ireland. In this week's episode, Jimmy is joined by Eamon Donnelly, co-founder of Uform, the Northern Irish manufacturing business, alongside BGF investor Paddy Graham. Eamon takes us through his founding story and explains how he strategically scaled the business through to exit with BGF support. He shares the standout challenges faced along the way, what good growth looked like to him, and remembers a time when the business was actually growing too fast. Introduce yourselves, your name, company, and what you do. I'm uh, Eamon Donnelly, the co-founder of Uform, and now sit on the board as a non-exact director. I'm Paddy Graham. I run Scotland and Northern Ireland for BGF. Eamon, what was the origin story behind Uform? What was the origin story behind Uform, Jimmy? Ah, so whenever I was 17, I went to a local technical college to study business studies. And my father had actually built a small bungalow and the gentleman who had actually done my father's kitchen had asked my father would he start selling kitchens for him because my dad was double jobbing and that's how we got the little bungalow built. And uh, just, I was an already working class family and dad turned around and he said to him, he says, look, to be quite honest, I'm too old actually to be taking on actually a new trade or trying to learn something new. The guy's name was Patsy Kelly, and he turned around and he said to me, he says, would you be interested, son? And I says, absolutely, but I've no car. And he says, we'll sort that for you. And I went to bed that night not thinking about selling kitchens, I bit a car. Yeah. So, so that's, how, that's, that, that's where it all started, and that was way back in, in, in the early 80s. And that's it, you went from a trade right through all the way to CEO. That seems quite a bit journey nowadays. Well, look, possibly it, it, it is a bit rare, you know, but look, at that particular time, whenever the creativity of planning a kitchen gelled with me very early on, it's something I just love doing because what you were doing is you were creating something that people were going to use, something that was going to make people happy, something that people, you know, were looking at and, and, and saying, you know, wow, this is... This, it was back to our little bungalow that Dad had built. We lived in a, in, in a social housing estate before that with a small kitchen that was eight foot by four foot. And seeing that wow on other people's faces who were doing exactly the same way back in the early 80s. So you get personal gratification out of seeing people very, very happy. Whenever I actually started planning and selling the kitchens, my father came out with me to the local neighbours who were also building small bungalows because he knew everybody. Yeah. And he was the credibility you'll give the young fella a chance, won't you, to press your kitchen? <laughs> and, and bit by bit, you know, you just got a bug for creating something special. And it seems as well that over that period of 40 years, the kitchen's become more central to people's lives in the sense of that, I mean, there used to be that the, there's now the joke about how we don't buy homes, we buy kitchens with homes attached to them. Do you feel that you've played a part in that? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, it's, you know... I, it's, it's, it's creating people's dreams, you know, because a kitchen is the heart of the home. Yeah. And it's, it's become a lot more expansive now. You know, obviously, you know, our, the, the home is, 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 is all about aspirational living spaces within the home now. It's, it's not about the kitchen anymore. It's about the bedroom. It's about the pantry. It's about the home office. It's about the media unit, you know, and, and, and it's about the bedroom. And on it goes then, obviously, within that, then it's internal storage, smart storage solution smart lighting solutions, you know, and that's creating atmosphere, creating functionality, and that's giving people so much more pragmatism with their kitchen as well. And then choices became so extensive over the last 40 years as well. It's an amazing origin story, and it shows how, um, you know, lives can change on, on quite small moments. You led it as a family business for kind of 30 years, and then BGF got involved a few years ago. Paddy, do you want to explain how you enter this story? We heard about Uform in the market and, and knew of the business because um, we'd been sort of operating in the, in, the, in the Northern Irish market for a few years by that point. And we were lucky enough to be invited um, to a um, management presentation. And I, I don't think Eamon will mind me, me, me saying this, but I think we were probably the, the, um, the, the test run for the, for the management team because at that point they were considering a, a majority uh, sale of the business, so we were the we were the we were the first 
uh, party through the door. But I, I think very quickly, and this is certainly, certainly my um, view of things, Eamon will have his own, his own view, which I'm sure he'll share, but there was an immediate connection in terms of culture of the organisations. So from Eamon and the team, we got a, a, a sense of huge ambition, which obviously we liked, um, a massive belief in the business and ownership of the business, having obviously built it from scratch. And we like to back people with that type of passion. Um, the other bit was just a cultural fit. Eamon and, and the team have you know, put a lot into um, the people that work in the business, the wider community. Um, and that's important for us. Uh, we like to obviously grow and expand businesses, but we like to do it in a sort of positive fashion that benefits not just the business and the stakeholders, but the but the broader community and regions that they operate in. And when did you first meet? 2018. That's it. And what were your your perceptions in in that meeting then? Well, it's a very different place in 2018. Perceptions of the meeting, I suppose, I suppose the back catalogue too, that's equally as important as well, because as a family business, you know, we had grew a business and I say to people, it's not that we didn't know how to run a business properly until the last recession happened, but, but we were making a few hundred thousand pounds every year, having a nice lifestyle, and trudging along with that, then the recession came. And this, is, the, this is the 08. Yeah, the 08 recession. Right? And whenever that recession came, you know, it was, it was squeaky bum time, you know, and we literally had to look at every single element of our business to keep that business actually surviving because revenue dropped in 15 months by half, literally just overnight. And that never leaves you. And as you go through a journey, and part of that journey was the Entrepreneur of the Year pro- program with Ernst & Young in 2016, where you meet past finalists yeah. and your cohort group for that year of 2016. And some of the stories, even you know, up until then, private equity was never ever on our radar. Didn't even, we never even focused on it. I hadn't a clue, what, what's private equity? Excuse the naivety, because back in the 80s when you're studying business, it just wasn't there. Yeah. And, and I went back and I'd done a master's as well, basically in, in late 90s. And even at that particular time, private equity had, w- would have been referred to. What, yes, did you, what did you do the master's in? in business. Or, yeah, but, uh, uh, where? At Open University. Oh, yeah. Open University. So f- 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 fundamentally, as, as we went on that journey, and that journey started in London at an awards night where we got tapped on the shoulder a couple of times. I remember it vividly. We were there actually um, as guests of PwC. We'd been shortlisted for fastest growing company in a uh, the, the small business. Uh, um, I, I can't remember specifically what the awards night was, but it was a small business, fastest growing company. And there was a company that went from nothing to 200 million in four years, a tech company. We were never winning it, but we, we went for the experience and the PR. And that night we could tap on the shoulder twice to say, look, we know people who's actually interested. Yeah. And that started the journey. If, uh, that was 17, that started the journey. And at that particular time, EY, the managing partner, you know, we were unsure, myself and my brother, because our father had passed. And, you know, but what we kept reflecting on was the, was the tough times in the recession. And as, we'd start, as, as we started to grow the business again, I mean, double digit growth every year in access to 20%, literally from 14 onwards, you know, you were still saying to yourself, how can we make this bigger and better? The, the ambition and the hunger really got there. And then we eventually put an IM out and Patty's, Pat, Patty, Graham and Gemma had come into U-Form and the chemistry from the off was just right. So just give us an idea of 2015, 2016, when you're doing those EY awards, et cetera, what... What scale is the business at that stage? Probably in round about, again, remember specifically, 2015-16, the business probably was sitting in round about 14, 15 million pounds. Yeah. Okay, in round about that time. And how many employees? Probably then in round about 130, 140 people. So you've, do, you've grown it then. And then, so what, what's your kind of thinking at that, that stage then? 2015, 2016, that, that's a sizable, serious business, right? That you've grown over 25 years. But what's your decision-making process at that stage then? It was based on actually understanding the, 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 the environment in which you work in, the size of the marketplace and saying, look, hold on a second, we've only got actually a 
couple of percent market share in the UK here, we want to take this to double, double digit percentage in the UK. And what did that mean? It actually, you know, you know, obviously, was your product position right? Was your back office right? Actually from, you know, the whole service element? Was the capability of your people right? You know, what do we need to actually fund that? Okay, stock in our game is a big game. Currently the business is carrying probably in close to what, 10 million pounds worth of stock. So turning that stock, you know, cash is king in any business as we know, particularly as you scale it, you know, you need the cash to do that. So our thinking was, alongside all of that, was what do we really need to do to, to, to make this happen? And alongside that, that, that's, you know, from a point of view of looking at, 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 at bringing investors in, we, we didn't know we wanted even to sell the business. And I suppose we went on a bit of a, a bit of a part of it was partly notional, but the bigger part for me was we do really need somebody to come in and to help us fulfill actually what we believe was a, was a good strategic plan with a very clear vision with back then, I suppose what we thought was like really good people. Yeah. Okay. But knowing that some of the people we would have to change to grow. Yeah. And because you build up a relationship with people over 10, 15, 20 years, that becomes more difficult to do than you think. Yeah. But the ambition never stopped. The ambition never stopped. And, and that's a common thing that we see in businesses and we certainly saw it with Eamon and, and the team is, um, you know, the, one thing's a level of, of ambition, uh, but another thing is, 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 is the uh, capability and desire to do it. And often companies and management teams tend sometimes exit slightly too early and um, don't realize the, the um, full ambition for the business. What we had here was a team that had the ambition, um, had the platform for growth, as Eamon says, it didn't have a, it, it, there was plenty to go at in, in the market. And, and we genuinely felt that we could, we could add in certain areas to support them in that, in that journey. So the first question I actually asked Eamon was, after he gave, him and the team gave us the presentation was, so, so why do you want to sell? Um, and I think that was a difficult question to answer because it, him and the team had put in so much to the business to that point, but also believed that it had a further journey to go to create even more scale. Absolutely, yeah. And can you remember what your answer was? Well, I think back, back, back then, Paddy might remember that better than I will, but I suppose for me, it was from the heart as it always is. It was pretty much a case of, look, you know, we need to bring better governance into this business. We need somebody to come in and challenge actually the strategic thinking. And we need somebody to actually challenge the capability of the people to deliver that strategy. Yeah. You know, and, and, and been truthful as well, back because we had actually a very rough ride over the recession, was, you know, we, we do want to take some money off the table as well. Yeah. And of which we, we obviously deliver, I mean, we deliver all of, all of those things whilst allowing even the team to retain, you know, control, control of the business. I think the other bit is, and this is, a, I think, a great thing about the Northern Irish market and you know, Eamon and the team as well, is that there's a humility in, in Northern Ireland. Um, you know, that, can, that can be positive and negative. On the negative side, you can suddenly think, well, we've got a great business here. I've, I've, you know, I've outstripped what others have done in the market, and now's the time. And that's why sometimes people tend to sell too early. Um, but, the, but the positive is, is that um, you know, management teams you know what they know what they know, but also seek guidance and input in terms of what they don't know, and that unlocks opportunity. And let's jump back there because I think it's quite interesting the image that you paint, and I can completely see it of you sort of going around in a small white van doing the local bungalow to begin with. It was actually a, a Talbot Sunbeam, and the story behind the Talbot Sunbeam as well is very very important because the Talbot Sunbeam was two year old and it was literally hit by a bus on the back end. And the guy had started tra uh, training me to, 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 to plan kitchens, basically said to me, look, by the time I have you trained to plan, I'll have that thing fixed. Yeah. Okay, and I put 148,000 miles on that car. But anyway, that's, that's just a happy memories. And I told with somebody, myself and my wife, going around the odd corner and the odd door flying open now and again, because <laughs> it wasn't terribly well fixed. But anyway, we, 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 we love to tell, <laughs> to, to, to tell another tale. But when was the moment you started the initial kind of like international expansion? Because Northern Ireland is its own culture, and I definitely want to come back to that at some stage. But when was the moment you thought, right, well, to increase our market size, 
did you go south to Ireland first or did you head towards the rest of the UK? No, we went south to Ireland first. That was obviously the most obvious choice. And we built that market very, very quickly. And we then tiptoed our way into the UK through a small distributor. And the rationale for that at the time was to actually find out without massive commitment uh, was what the wants and needs were of that dynamic of customer in the UK mainland, as opposed to because, you know, people are different by region. OK, so Ireland's Ireland, but the UK wants and needs and tastes and service expectations, quality expectations, product needs. You know, so we're able to tip in or tiptoe in with it with a distributor back in the day, basically. Um, probably that would have been in around probably, probably 2009, 2010. OK, and how did you find it? And when did you think, okay, we'll double down and how did you go about that then? So you're doing this post the post the recession? 2007, went under the UK. Lovely time then, so just before. Good. Yeah. Okay. Um, so when the recession happened, did you then think, did you sort of pull back, pull back then to, just to Ireland and? No, not at all. Because obviously, you know, your, your, your product catalogs, your product catalog, because what drives our business is fundamentally concession space and independent retailers showrooms you know so we have got to get display space we've got to make sure that's as prominent as possible and we've got to make the product as easy to sell as possible yeah. okay for a retailer so when you're in there you know you just can't throw it out you've got to keep supplying it the challenges for the business were obviously a reduction in sales working capital primarily we didn't have any credit insurance in place at that time so bad debt became an, became an issue so obviously the stress on working capital and cash burn yeah. you know was quite was quite severe so that was more of the, where the focus needed to be. How do we improve? How, how do we improve stock turn? How do we improve working capital? Those were the two main focus uh, 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 parts of the business. Uh, well, during and post the recession. Um, and you touched on the stage that I think a lot of businesses that scale when they've been running it for 10, 15, 20 years of having to let go of some of those people that were perhaps there at the early stages. What advice would you give to entrepreneurs that are having to go through that? If I were to do it all over again, for God's sake, do not cut the front end of the business from, from a sales function point of view. That's the first thing. You know, keep believing basically that you can still actually move the, the needle on the marketplace on your share, which we, which we, irrespective of a recession, we had still such a small, small share, but we did literally obliterate overhead, which was the wrong thing to do, okay? The second thing at the end of the day, what would I do different, and I've said this before, is recruit basically, I've talked about the three A's many times, recruit A stars, pay A star wages, but expect A star results. So part of the journey is that agriculture mentality that we have, which can be a negative in Northern Ireland, you know, back in the day, well, the going rate is, it's eight pounds 50, we'll pay you seven pounds 90 an hour, right? Or the going rate is, it's, it's 40,000 pounds basically for a, a, a senior manager's role, but we, we'll try and get you for 32,000. That was completely wrong. And that's the mentality in which you grow up with sometimes. Yeah. But when you start to actually, I always say to the sum of the five or six people around you that's, that, that, you know, that's really successful. Yeah. And even by going to the Entrepreneur of the Year program in Boston in 2016 and networking with other like-minded individuals who became very successful and scaled their business, the common denominator was people. Yeah. Apart from, yes, you have a clear, a clear strategy, but having the real good people who's highly capable to challenge you and to deliver that strategic plan yeah. was, 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 was you know, one of the things that I left with the most. You know, and then whenever BGF come in, you know, we're proud to say that part of, part, part of the legacy that we probably now have, having stepped back from the business, is that you know, the average living wage in Northern Ireland is approximately around about 23, 24,000 pounds. Us as a company are paying 34,000 pounds which is remarkable given we're a countryside business. Yeah. And that just actually epitomizes, you know, looking after your people because people do need in this environment, well, you know, it's not all about money, it's a part of it, yeah. okay? But you have to do that to, to, to get the right people. And how many people are you now? Last count, I think, in the group's 407. Yeah, okay. Still still on the details to the precise map. And, and tell us about, one of the things you talk about there, strategy, mission statement as well, being very important. Absolutely, because, you know, it's, it's the focus of everything you do, you know, and, and the values drive all that as well. You know, I'd say more importantly, 
you know, you know, we've got a very, very clear vision, vision you know, of, of, of basically creating aspirational living spaces in people's homes. And, you know, the word kitchen, you know, that's the biggest change in our business uh, and, and will be going forward, you know. So we want, you know, we're rebranding at the moment our B2C brand, which was called Kitchen Story. It's now Story. So it's your story of your home. So fundamentally, that's, that, that, that's what's changed most in the business. But it's obviously your mission's your mission. And that's our very clear vision. So how do we actually improve wallet spend with our customers and you improve wallet spend by actually creating opportunity for them to purchase more, pro more, more product from you for the home. You know, so, and, you know, so, and we've expanded just over the last six months. We've gone into internal storage, we've gone into bedrooms, and we've been actually made the measure across most of our ranges as well. So that opens up actually much more actually into the replacement or refurbishment market as well for us. So the, the ambition is, is still there. Absolutely, because we've got a, we've got a, 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 a really, really, really capable senior team of people who are, are invested in the business, who are, you know, work tirelessly towards a very, very clear strategic plan. And, you know, it's not a complex, it's not a complex plan. It's a very, very clear strategic plan with four pillars. And, you know, everybody's clear on what needs to actually be delivered. So, so talk to us about this this stage then when BGF kind of come in and how it sort of because it's, it's I imagine it's particularly hard kind of in a, in a family business to have the conversations about what do we where do we want this to go etc because it's ends up being wrapped up with so many kind of like personal things as well and you know more about the people than you might do their kind of co-founders traditional co-founders and you've known them for a lot longer I'd be fascinated about how you're Robert, had the, how you had the conversation about what do we actually want for the business? I, I, I th look, I think the first thing basically that we wanted for the business was, as I said earlier, we didn't know going into this where we're going to sell any of the business. We're going to sell all of the business, right? And as we went on that journey, it became, you know, very, very apparent that one back to culture, getting the right fit of people was, was, was absolutely number one. Two, yes, pre going into that, you know, back to the four points I made earlier, you know, bringing somebody in that you know was going to actually improve the corporate governance within the boardroom. Two, challenge the strategy. Three, bring in more capable people, okay? And four, taking some money off the table. As you went on that journey, we, I think there were six management presentations done and BGR for the first one, but they were the one that, stu that stood out because we had great offers from other people as well, but it was all back to the people. Can I work with you? And it became very evident that we didn't want to sell the business as we went on that journey, yeah. that we just wanted to take investment. And that's what BGF done wonderfully, you know, and, and fundamentally, when the, when, whenever BGF did come into the business, you know, and there was lots of more conversations, obviously, but it became very, very clear that we still run that business. Uh, what, 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 I'd love to. I was, yeah. Paddy, I'd love to hear about this from your perspective because you're always trying to work out what they, what they, what they want. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's the biggest question in every investment that we we go into. And it's not just from a business perspective; it's also from a personal yeah. perspective uh, and human perspective. So, yeah, it's a huge focus for us. I mean, we look at our business as a relationship-focused business. Um, yes we need to do good investments and make, make good returns. But fundamentally, we want to work with great people. Um, so we spend a lot of time on it at the front end. So from a business side, it's really understanding, as Eamon touched upon there, you know, the strategy, where, they, where management see the business going, where we can input into that, and getting as much alignment as possible from the outset in terms of what that plan is and what the, what the ultimate goal is. And that will change over time and, and up, there'll be ups and downs but as long as you retain alignment and, and communication around that then it ensures the journey's fun um, and you ultimately maximise your chances of getting to a good result. And, and how, do you do, how do you work out the sort of personal? So well the personal bit is so you spend time in the business speaking to the management team about the business but the personal stuff you spend time with the people on the, before you, because again, you, you've got both sides have to feel that there's a genuine trust connection, because if you don't have that, it could turn out to be a very unenjoyable five to seven years of your, of your life if you've got the wrong investor or 
or dynamic around the table. So we just ask the the open questions and go, well, what what do you want from this process in the next five to ten years, et cetera, et cetera. And we try to as best possible you know, ensure that we structure appropriately on the on the way in to deliver what it what it might be at that point in time. But then again just we know what the ultimate goals are and and are are aligned with that and, and and that filters into the business strategy so it's just i say i say it a lot my team give off to me a lot about it but it's just alignment 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 for me and if you lose that sort of everything starts to starts to suffer um so that's why we spend a lot of time with the people before we and so what did you decide to do? Let's just be clear about this for people that don't know. You sold how much to the business, et cetera? At that particular time, 26%. So we did. And um, best thing we've ever done. <laughs> That's a pretty unequivocal. Why 26? It just, it just, that was the number that everybody got comfortable with. So it was from, it's, it's you a, know. It's, there's no science in it. It's, just, it's ultimately, it's just... I, I, I call it the zone of mutual discomfort. So <laughs> there's a negotiation and one party feels that they're giving up a bit too much. The other party feels that they're yeah. paying, not getting quite enough. But you look at each other in the eye and you go, as we talked about earlier, a deal, a deal's a deal and let's but that was it, and, and that was it, Paddy. You know, you know, everybody got comfortable with that number, a, a, you know, a number that trans, you know, translated back to 26%. Of the shares in the business been been been, been, been invested with BGF. Prior to that, you were one hundred percent family owned, right? The, yeah, yeah, the yeah. other investors yeah, yeah. at all. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So it's a, it's a it's a but it's a big step to take, isn't it? It is, but it's a huge step. It's your it's your life's work. It, no, it, it, it is your life's work. But as as Patty as, as Patty as, as, as actually spoke about there, we we you know we have met many times post that management presentation, and at any time. Each side could turn around and say, "Well, you know, I, I don't care. You know, we're not right for each other." And it's going to sound a bit corny, but uh, corny. But but fundamentally, the more we met, the more we became more and more and more aligned, and the more confident I became to say, "You know something? We're really going to make things happen, happen bigger, faster, better yeah. within our business." And, and the important bit as well is, I mean, I've been investing a long time, done lots and lots of of transactions but we are not a transactional business albeit we're high volume we are not tra- tra- transactional this is this is for anybody particularly family owned businesses it is a huge decision so we do not underestimate that and we take it extremely seriously because we are being invited into their world and into their business so um and i, and I hope that comes across for me. how did you two build a relationship outside of the boardroom well, I mean, there's the other, we've had lots of dinners and uh, one, one or two Guinnesses now and again. Lots and, of great um, bars in Belfast. Yeah, that's yeah. All I'm saying. So, 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 I mean, I, I wasn't, I wasn't yeah. actually, I wasn't on the board of, of the business and my team are on most of the boards of our existing portfolio. But I see my, my role and the team's role is, yeah, you, the board meetings are structured, formal, you talk about strategy, etc. However, you get just as much, if not, time, not sometimes a bit more, out with the business and the board just talking about yeah. people's concerns, problems, opportunities, and all of that, number one, builds a relationship, but number two, helps inform for future board meetings. And, it, and we, I find that informal engagement the most, often the most valuable. Uh, uh, you know, I suppose there's two parts to that is, you know, pre, pre the deal, you know, you build that relationship by an approach from BGF, and that approach was not, it was not aggressive, it was basically participative, you know, it was collaborative, you know, with, with what was asked for, how it was asked. And, you know, even a management team working with the BGF team at that particular time, you know, you were, you were building actually, as I say, you know, confidence every week. Yeah. We're doing the right thing here because we've been challenged. And I remember even coming up to the, you know, up, up to the, 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 the management presentations before BGF even came in the pitch. I, 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 I learned and I've seen so much about our existing team. You know, about, you know, the good, the bad and the indifferent. You know, who was, you know, who was really stepping up? Who was confident? Who was volatile? You know, who was out of their comfort zone? You know, so you know, even before what happened, you learn so much as you go on the, pro- on, on the journey as well. You know, so 
and, and you've seen, you know, were people really aligned to your ambition, your drive? Yeah. And, and in, in, in which area did they bring the, the most impact, do you think? Uh, look, from, from, from our perspective, a chair coming into the business was, was exceptionally helpful to challenge the thinking of the senior team and the, and, and the delivery of the, of the strategic plan. You know, the financials, you know, have been challenged basically in terms of, you know, all the usual actually covenant compliance, you know, making sure that the board pack that was, was there pre-investment and I've said before, it's totally was unrecognizable three or four board meetings in. It just made a lot more sense and it was focusing primarily on the key enablers to deliver our strategic plan. So it brought structure to that, it brought challenge, you know, it brought actually good governance, you know, so it was across all of those. There was, I wouldn't say there was any one particular, one particular basically part, but for, I suppose on reflection, what it really, what BGF really did do was they got us match fit for the next exit. Right. All right. And as a, as a consequence of all of those parts, the, the cherry on the top was, we're ready. We're ready for who wants to come at us here. We know we've got a damn bloody good business. Yeah, because I mean, the, the business when we looked at it was a, obviously a very good business, great product, great customer service, and that's what stood it apart. Um, so there was a solid platform there. Then it was a case of, well, the plan was to sort of more than double the business from that point until exit, and we pretty much did that. Did that yeah. Doubling to what at this stage? Actually value. Yeah, and what revenue-wise, was it taking up to? Re well, revenue-wise, what was it in, in uh, 2022? Probably close to 55 million, Yeah, roughly, from memory. That was, and then plus Honduras, I think, maybe on top yeah. of that. So it's it's enabling. So you've got a you've got a base base pl platform there, and then it's as it, as Eamon says, getting it match fit. So it's supplementing any of the gaps in the team, or um, and putting in the right procedures, et cetera, to allow the business to be able to scale quite meaningfully to the next to the next level without tripping over itself. Yeah. Um, and also, again, it might sound a little bit corny, but I think just giving. And this doesn't necessarily apply as much in Eamon's case because Eamon was extremely confident in, in delivering his plan. But it's just with a bit of investment and support, it's that additional confidence that the management team have. So they have a bit of cash off the table as well, which helps and it secures the family. But then it's just that focus on the plan and hopefully support in the right areas to give the business and the team confidence to turn the handle on, on the growth. And, and was that laser focus? on the five or six key enablers yeah. became actually, you know, a constant heartbeat of board meetings, you know, yeah. and, and that's what drove the success of the business because you, know, you can look at 20 things, but there's only a few things that actually moves the dial. And it was that constant, res, you know, resilient focus and questioning of that. I remember, I remember the chairman starting in the business and probably third board meeting and, you know, you know, guys, what, what exactly is the horsepower in the engine of this? Of this, of this, this company, and he was resilient, you know, and he didn't get the answer at that board meeting, and that was a gap that we had in our business, you know. Well, we think we can go to here, but what is the horsepower? And what he really meant by that was stop thinking single shifts, start thinking over three shifts. Yeah. What can we really do to maximise this? Okay, and it, you know that 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 basically just gets people focused a different way and more more hungry, more ambition, you know. So, and talk to us about the next exit then. Yeah, well, look. Obviously, the 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 next exit, we obviously had targets in place for ourselves, where we where we would like to get to, where we'd like to get equity value to, what 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 the multiple we we had hoped to get, and we just thought, look, you know, all the stars have lined up against equity value, against actually the EBITDA that we had in the business, against appetite actually for the business within the marketplace. So I suppose those three drivers really, you know, we said, you know, now's the time to do this, yeah. you know, and, and, and we've done it. And again, all over again, only it was a slightly, well, not slightly, it was, it, it, was, it was a lot more different this time because this was a majority exit for us. Although we're not, you know, we still have 25% of the business, myself and my brother, BGF are still invested as well. I think you guys still have maybe, what, 8%? Yeah. You know, so, so that in itself says a lot about the business as well. And it also says a lot about the new investors, you know, that they see, great value 
and you know all those parts still been around the table. But so so we so we done it for those reasons. We we got comfortable again mm. with a number. We got comfortable with where we you know where we wanted them out, and and that was delivered. And as I say, BGF were able to help us position the business and take it to, take it to that stage. You know where I think the equity value from BGF and uh, invested was 38 million, and the equity value on our last actually investment was 69 million. Yeah. You know, and that was that was probably in around but slightly less than four years, and you know everybody was very happy with that. Yeah. But I, but yeah, I can imagine. Um, and but Paddy, talk to us about like how what what's in your kind of like thought process when you, know, you take the initial twenty six percent and so on. Like you're obviously making that investment to make returns. Yeah. What what is the like people's you know dealing with people and human emotions here right as well that does change over a number of years as we talked about already. What's your kind of focus as a business at that stage when you come on? I'm going to sound like a broken record here, but at that point, it is, it is alignment on 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 end goal, which, as you say, things do change and things happen in people's lives. So again, it's, it's yeah. we as an investor, it's it's away from that just purely transactional approach to the sort of human relationship approach. And if things change, if hopefully the relationship will you know, is strong enough to be able to. Each party sort of has the mutual respect that you find you find a way through. And we were fortunate in, in, in this scenario where pretty much you know, the end result for everybody was exactly sort of what we mapped out at the get go. There was undoubtedly challenges and and opportunities along the way, um, which you again was we navigated uh, because we had the strength of relationship and we all re respected one another and we all were pointing in the same direction. You talked about the financial crash, the Great Recession, and so much slowing down, um, almost when you're having uh, kind of negative growth. When's the moment you've been having too much growth? Does that exist? Oh, did it did. I can tell you, that's for sure, yeah. 2018, I'll never forget it. Um, we had just commissioned, actually, a new extension, one of many. And for the first time ever, the company actually showcased at the kitchen, bedroom, and bathroom exhibition in February 2018 in Birmingham, the NEC. And it was also, it was also our 25 year anniversary. But primarily the reason we were there was not our 25th anniversary was we wanted to aggressively attack the UK mainland because prior to that, the best way I would describe it is we're like a little Jack Russell with very, very sharp teeth running up the sidelines of this big football pitch called UK Mainland, and nobody seen us or understood us. <laughs> but by God, did we arrive in Birmingham, I tell you, a fanfare. Yeah. Well, my God of Almighty. People saw you then. They saw us then, and our order book exploded. And that was, you know, and it didn't explode for one month, it exploded for probably, I would say, a good six, seven months. Everything in business is around a very, very a, a reasonable sales forecast, yeah. because everything flows from that. And our sales forecast, I remember vividly for at least what four out of those six months was 40% of a variance <laughs> the wrong way. And we just said, what in the name of God? So it was the complete opposite to the recession. Mm. This was just, it was a perfect storm in many ways. But the bit that really broke my heart, and I mean, it, 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 it hit me harder personally than any recession because I was letting customers down. My values as a person. You know, not, not me, per you know, well, yes, me personally, but the company, we were letting customers down hand over fist and it was incredibly painful. And it, again, we had to take a bottom up look at Agley or, or, or and we were going through the deal with, 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 with BGF as well. And we were just growing for fun. Yeah. I mean, it was, I think that year our growth was in excess of 30%. And that was in the back of Agley launching ourselves on the UK mainland with what were wonderful products great people, people who had bought into the brand, brought into the products, you know, but services, everything. Yeah. And we were letting people down. And again, it was like a rebuild of internal likely systems within the business. But the biggest part we had, we had in room. And the place the room was initiated in terms of more space. We hadn't that properly wrapped up until October that year. So by Christmas in 2018, I will never forget the day I died. My son come and looking for me who worked in the business at the time. And we had our 
we had our annual Christmas Ackley buffet where we give out Ackley awards for timekeeping and attendance and all that sort of stuff, which is, which is great with our people and everything. And I was always the last one out of the building. And I remember my son coming looking for me and standing down Ackley, the back of the factory, crying like a baby and reflecting on what my father had said to me on his deathbed post the recession. I remember him saying, son, promise me one thing. You know, the small fire will keep you warm and the big one will burn you. But he says, you've got the business turned around now. Promise me, he says, you don't grow it very much. And all this was going through my head on Christmas 18. Should I have listened to you, Dad? And I turned around and said to Dad then, no, I can't promise you that, Dad, because I'm too ambitious. But that's what was going through my head. So probably out of my, out of the last 40 years in business, that was the toughest time that year because we were letting people down. And how did you recalibrate? You, you, you surround yourself again with the right people. You, you get, you know, we, we, we have wonderful, we, well, we had wonderful people around us, but, you know, you divide and conquer, yeah. you know, and fundamentally what you do, you get a grip of what, you know, the two or three things that's going to make the biggest difference from a process point of view. Stock was a massive issue because we hadn't got it to sell because our forecasts were out. Then whenever the stock did start coming in, you start to actually make sure that the, the, the building you were putting up, how quickly can we get this darn thing built? Yeah. Okay, you know, basically uh, stock accuracy, you know, without getting into the micro too much, you know, yeah. there, 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 there was, there, there was a, a very, very, a very big light on the three or four things that made the big difference. And you just incessantly focused on them and kept working and working and working. And the KPIs in the business are for a business, you know, even then our size were extraordinary. You know, we've got a very, very, very strong ERP system in the business. We've got strong actually metrics that, you know, that, that, that manage literally everything that happens. So you were keeping obviously a very, very tight eye on the metrics and making sure that they were improving. Should that have been 0.1% a day or, or a week, you know, as long as they were going the right way. And I suppose the, the underlying thing to it all was, you know, one of our values has been open and honest and been absolutely blatantly open and honest with your customer base, you know, about what you were doing to make it right. Please, please stay with us. Here's what's happened, here's why it's happened, but here's how we're fixing it. And aligning your sales team and everybody front facing to be consistent with what we're doing to make it better. Um, and I wanted to talk to you uh, a bit about Northern Irish culture as well. Yep. You have described it as agricultural at points. Yep. <laughs> to make sure that's very clear that you've said that. What do you mean by that? We can be very narrow minded in our thinking, very insular. Okay. And we always want something for nothing. <laughs> was pretty much how I would sum that up. And what, okay, so what advice would you give to other Northern Irish entrepreneurs? Because you're spending a lot of time now as well, sort of going around, doing lots of talking, et cetera. It's one of the benefits of exiting a business in your early um, in your 50s, right? You Wish it was my early 50s. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to pick you up on that. You, know? <laughs> you just look it. You just look yeah. it, right? Always, always, always. Oh, dear God. Um, but you're spending a lot of time. I think it's really admirable doing stuff like this and you're a great storyteller and going out. What, what's your advice to Northern Irish entrepreneurs? You, look, you have got to have a very, very good understanding of your space, the size of your space, what makes that space tick, and where you fit in that space, and what your core competence is. Stay true to that, first and foremost. Maximize the return on that space. You know, the kitchen market now is worth probably £7 billion. We know what our percentage shareholding is now and where we need to get to. So understand that macro element of your business, no matter what it is, okay? Who your competition is, where your strengths are, where your weaknesses are. But you've got to be very clear on your planning, your strategic planning, and you've got to make damn sure that you've got a team of people around you who's capable and give them autonomy to do the job. Don't micromanage anybody. Believe in your people, trust your people, but have them aligned you know, to your strategic thinking, have them a fit basically within actually the vision of the business, but more so aligned totally to your values. You know, and whatever those values are, every day, even still a new form, not that I'm in it every day or every week now, but as I meet people, I look at their behaviors and are those behaviors aligned to the values? That's where it starts with me. You also said that vulnerability never leaves you. No, it doesn't because failure Failure will never happen in my life because I'll let it happen. 
because I'll always be sitting on the edge of being vulnerable to failure. Yeah. I always know what it looks like, I know what it tastes like, and I've worked too damn hard to fail at anything. And I haven't in my life, I'm not going to now. And you need like-minded people thinking the same way around you, without being arrogant, without having a bad attitude, but in a participative way, in a collaborative way. What does good growth mean to you? Sustainable, with good service, with good quality, um, and profitable. Uh, thanks so much for Not at all. coming on this. Pleasure. Thank you for asking me. It's an amazing story. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Paddy. No problem. Thank you.